Right. Good morning, everyone. And good morning to our students online as well. I think the camera is a bit too low. Okay, let's begin this time with a word of prayer and uh, then we'll get into our session. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you, Lord, for just giving us this opportunity to come together and learn. Lord, even as we learn, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will minister to our hearts, minister to our lives. Lord, that everything that we learn, we will use it and it will bear fruit in our lives. Lord, we, we submit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So uh, let's just quickly do a review of what we did last week. Last week we looked at quite a few things. We looked at, uh, from, I think it was from chapter from about chapter 50 onwards, we looked at the law of the Spirit, how the Lord Jesus has freed us from the law of sin and from the law of death. So right now, you and I as believers, we walk in the spirit of life. And Galatians talks, of, Paul writes to the believers, he says, walk in the spirit. That means everything you do, everything that you say, Every part of your being should be led by the Holy Spirit, right? And we looked at that very important verse, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So when we are led by the Holy Spirit, we also looked at how to listen to the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, he ministers to us. He speaks to us. Uh, and he has different ways of speaking to us. And you'll learn more about that in the Holy Spirit class as well. And 58, we looked at praying, chapter 58, uh, praying empowered by the spirit of life. So now, when as you and I are children of God, led by the Holy Spirit, prayer is no more boring. Prayer is not something that is going to make us feel bored. Right? Because why? Paul writes, he says, we have a helper who will intercede on our behalf, right? And so now when we are praying in the spirit, we are praying mysteries of God and we are being edified, right? Uh, then we looked at in him, we have redemption. And then we very importantly looked at the blood of Jesus. What is it? What did his blood do? His blood freed us. His blood speaks. His blood delivered us from Satan's dominion. And now you and I are God's property. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. Now, we will also you know, touched on why the Old Testament, the law is a curse, right? Because in the Old Covenant, it was all by works. Everyone were coming to God by the works that they are doing. Right, But in the new covenant, it's no longer the works that we do. We're coming by the grace of God. And then we looked at, we are redeemed from every lawless deed. I, I think we start from chapter 66, if I'm not wrong. Yes, 66. Right? Redeemed from the present evil age. Let me just double check. 67? Yes, okay. 67, we are redeemed from the fear of death. Let's read Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through his death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Paul is saying, now, is death scary? In the natural, is death scary? Is it fearful? Yes. Right? You know, as, a, as part of the pastoral team, we go to funerals. And funerals is it's very painful time, right? Especially when you know, there was a season when we had 
young people and small children who were passing away. We would go and we had to bury these children. What can we say? Some of them, uh, you know, they were 10 years old. Some of them were five years old. Some of them were just born babies. Then you have even youth. It's, it's very, very painful. It's fearful. Right? Every time, you know, you go to a funeral, reality sinks into your life. Right? You think, oh, man, this is where I'm going to end up one day. Right? You can't take anything with you. But if fear comes, it's a natural thing. It's natural right, to fear death. But what did Jesus do? Jesus, in Hebrews, it says, he released those who fear, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Fear will come, but we must be able to overcome that fear. Fear of death will come. Oh, wow. No, especially if it's family, fear will come. You know, sometimes we hear the word hospital and we get a little bit weary it's a natural thing but we are not in bondage right it's not like because of this death my life is over no that as believers the lord jesus has redeemed us from the fear of death he has taken us out right so now death is not the end right let's read this portion uh, i love this passage it's not in your notes but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 54 onwards, 54 to 56. Fifty seven, sorry. First Corinthians chapter 15 was 54 to 57. Go ahead. Anyone want to read that? When the perishable has weak worth with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then, uh, then the saying that it is a uh, region will come to. That has been swallowed up in victory. Where all that is your victory, where all that is your sting, the sting of that is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks to be, uh, be to God, He give us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now look at this verse. The Lord, the Apostle Paul is talking about the resurrected body, right? And he's telling the believers, when the perishable, that means something which is, which can die away, is overcome by the imperishable. That means when we get the glorified body, here's the question we can ask here in verse, uh, the following verse, 54. Death where is your sting grave where is death where is your victory grave where is your sting the sting of sin is death death came into this world because of sin now now because of this because of what jesus did death has been swallowed up in victory will we get an have a natural death yes but that's not the end Paul is saying here, death has been overcome by the Lord Jesus. So that is why when believers die, yes, it is painful, but there is a hope. There is a joy knowing that this is not the end. We know that the person, if he was in the Lord as a believer, he is with the Lord Jesus in heaven. He's alive imperishable body right death where is your sting grave where is your victory so very emphatically the apostle paul is saying what satan brought into this world through sin is death now what jesus did i've overcome death also he's saying now i'm alive and because i am alive you will live and you will not just live a normal life you will have a glorious body you live just like how I am, the glorified life, right? So isn't this encouraging? 
Yes, right? It's so powerful when you think of it, that it's not the end. Death is not the end, right? So the blood of Jesus has redeemed us. He has paid the price that we don't have to fear death, right? We are redeemed from generational bondages. First Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you are not redeemed with incorruptible, in, with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So here again, when we talk about generational curses, there is a, there's a lot that we can talk about. Right? Now, for example, there could be a person Right? Generational, curse, generational curses basically happen, it can happen over hundreds of years, it can happen over 10, 20 years, right? but it can go from generation to generation to generation. Now, let me give you an example. There's a, there's a family, okay? they're unbelievers, and every first child of that family dies. This is just an example, right? Every first child, firstborn, is dying. It happened from the past 10 years, it's happening. Every first child is dying. Now, what is it? It can be a generational curse. Now, all of a sudden, one of them becomes a believer. Now, this generational curse that was happening for the past 100 or 20 years, or however long that is, the moment a person becomes a believer, he believes that the Lord Jesus died on the cross, took my sins, and now I'm a new person, and I'm no longer a slave to the devil. Once he believes he's a believer, all of those generational curses have been broken. All. Whether it is 100 years, whether it is 500 years, whether it is 1,000 years, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't even matter what kind of generational curse it is. All of those curses are broken just because one person believes in Jesus. Right? Isn't that powerful? You see what the blood of Jesus did? The Lord Jesus is not saying, oh, now this is uh, so many years. No, you have to fast 40 days. Every month you fast 40 days. Then we'll see whether the curse is gone. No. No works. All we have to do is believe that curse, curse is broken. Now, here's the second point that we must understand. If we keep believing that, hey, this curse is working in my life, this is what happened. Past 100 years, this is happening. It's a generational curse. And I hope it's not, uh, you know, if we keep thinking that it's going to come upon us, what is happening? I am opening a door for the devil to begin to work. And what's happening? The devil begins to work. Where there is no faith, what comes in? Fear. Right? Instead of faith, fear will come in. But if you replace that fear and say, hey, I'm going to replace this fear with faith in God, because God is bigger than any generational curse, that curse is broken. Okay? So some of us may be in a place where, hey, so many years, you know, my great grandfathers or my generations were worshiping you know maybe other gods and idols what about me now it is all broken the moment you believed in jesus amen it's all broken don't believe the lie of the enemy now he will try to say you know maybe this is a generational curse what do you must say that time you say i rebuke that thought devil the bible says when the Lord Jesus died, he freed us. He redeemed us from generational bondages, from curses. I've been redeemed. So this has no entry in my life. Yes, there may be problems that I'm going through, but it does not have anything to do with that because that is already destroyed. It's already broken. Yes? Okay, Shaker, do you have a question? Uh, you raise your hands, Shaker and Gertrude. Yes, Pastor, I have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, is this generational curse is broken only for the believer or his entire family? 
yeah that's a good question so firstly so for example now i uh, there, there's a person he was an unbeliever and he becomes a believer for him personally the bondages have been broken now okay now if he gets married or if he's already married and after his you know he's got a family and after that he becomes a believer the curses in his life has been broken but the bible also says that if one person in the family is saved the entire family is saved right so gertrude i would say that because of this one person becoming a believer the entire family his family i'm not talking about you know his brothers and his brother's family or sister's family i'm talking about his immediate family right can be saved right uh, and now again there's a part where the the other other members in the family will have to submit themselves or they will have to you know basically give themselves to the lord say lord these are the things in my life so there's a work that the person who's a believer has to do meaning he'll have to share the gospel minister to the person but salvation has already come into that house right but the curses for them are not broken no pastor so the curses will still be there because the person right the the person is not yet a believer but when it comes to the generational when you talk about okay so in my mind what my what the question you're asking is see now for example there's a person and he gets married right oh, an unbeliever he has there are certain generational curses he becomes a believer and now he gets married so for example his wife is not a believer but he is a believer yes so your gertrude your question is what about the wife will she be will she no my entire entire family pastor not only the wife say children your brother sisters will the curses be broken for them as yes. well only yes. for a believer no for the entire family because this person who is now see the curse is broken right the person who has believed has believed and the curse is broken for the entire family but the others in the family should receive it right should accept it now that is the challenge which this person will have to face he'll have to share with the with their other family members that hey this is what jesus did and uh, this is how jesus broke the law broke the curse and we don't have to live in bondage these curses are broken so the person who became a believer he has a work to do right but to answer your question the entire family is his immediate family is the the bondages have been broken okay right? pastor yeah okay chapter 69 we are restored unto god everyone say restored the word restored means uh say for example there's an old building right it's an old building like 100 year old building what do they do they say okay one well, architect comes and says this is a very important building so let us restore it meaning let us make it in a place that it can stay for another 100 years so what will they do they'll paint it they'll fill up all the cracks on the wall they'll paint the place you know make sure that the connections are all right the electricity is all what are they doing they're restoring it they're not breaking it down but they're restoring it meaning making it as it was before now what are we re restored unto god how are we restored unto god remember adam In the book of Genesis, what does it say? Adam walked with God. In the cool of the day, Adam walked with God. Imagine, there's a garden. God is walking. Adam is walking with God. God is telling, "See, Adam, this is the plant. This is how you put the seed in the ground. Right? These are animals, right? These different animals are there. They all have different. So God taught him everything." Adam was with God. He walked with God. And then sin came. What happened? He's hiding now. God comes and asks, "What happened? Where are you, Adam? It's time to meet." Adam says, "No, no, I'm hiding because I'm naked. Who told you you're naked?" 
No, because the serpent made me eat the fruit. Now what happened? Separation. Because of sin, man could not go near God. Adam could not go near God because of sin. Now that continued for a long time. After the blood of Jesus, after Jesus died on the cross, this separation of man not being able to go to God has been closed. So God is saying, sin is there, but through the blood of Jesus, I will enter and I can be with God the Father. In the book of Romans, he says, no, through his spirit, we cry out above Father. You understood this, right? So we are restored the same position that Adam had before the fall. We are restored to that position. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God and righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. What did we become? Righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Because how? Through the wisdom who became for us the wisdom from God. Right? Let's look at the next one. Let the redeemed say so. Psalms 107 verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So basically, this is a verse of declaration, emphatic declaration. If you're redeemed of the Lord, say it, declare it, walk that way, show it in your lifestyle. That's what it basically means. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So when the enemy comes and the enemy says, these are the wrong things or these are the things that you're doing, again, doing wrong and you can, you, know, you can do this, nothing will happen. You are the redeemed of the Lord and you stay what you are. You have to speak it. Remember the, the verse in Proverbs, what does it say? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. What you speak is what you will get. It's a, it's a fruit of your lips. If I speak negative words, wrong words, words of discouragement, words of failure upon myself, what will happen? Death and power are in, the life, are in your tongue. We, and we will eat the fruit of it. If I say I am useless, I am unworthy, I am not saved, I God, I, I am nothing, what will happen? What that will be? But if I say, hey, I am, I'm not perfect yet. I do sin, I do make mistakes, but I've been bought by a price. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Now what's happening? The devil has no entry point. The devil can't say, no, hey, you did so many things wrong. You're saying, I already know. I told Jesus I did so many wrong. But I'm still redeemed because of the blood of Jesus. You're understanding what this position that you're taking, right? So when we sin, we don't have to run away. You tell Jesus, Jesus, these are the places where I do wrong. These are the places where I need your help, right? I need your help to change certain things in my life. And, and then you can still hold that position, but I am redeemed of God. The Lord Jesus has redeemed me. Just because I did wrong, Jesus is not saying, you know, uh, you know, you're no longer my child. He's not saying that. So as believers, as redeemed of the Lord, we should say what we want to see and what we want to do in life. Okay, everyone say after me, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say, I will say so. Right? You speak what you want in your life right chapter 72 testify to the blood Rome, revelations chapter 12 and verse 11 a very powerful verse and this is a verse that has really really helped me in my and it continues to help me in my spiritual walk right my daily life they overcame him uh, talking about the enemy and talking about his demons, they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their 
testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Everyone say this. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of her, your testimony. Two things. This verse will really help us to overcome challenges in life, temptations that come. So when temptation comes, you say, I will overcome him. I will overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. The blood has been shed. Jesus has shed the blood. Now you're just speaking it, right? It can be in a small voice, but in the spiritual realms, there's a battle happening. Satan and his demons are being defeated, right? These demons that come to tempt us, to bring confusion, fear. In the, in the spiritual, there's a battle happening. What you're doing, you're just sitting in your room saying, I overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. But in the spiritual, there's a battle. And how am I overcome? How will I overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The testimony of the blood of Jesus. Now, there's a saying, right? The devil sometimes believes more in Jesus than anybody else, than any of us. You know something? The devil knows the power of Jesus. He knows what Jesus is. He knows the authority that the blood has. And that's why he doesn't want us to believe it. He doesn't want us to believe even, you know, Jesus is real. He doesn't want us to believe. And that's why he uses deception. Why is it that so many people in the world who are believers now, they are unbelievers? Deception. He doesn't want them to believe. Because if they believe, oh, they'll believe. And he knows the power of the blood. So he wants us not to believe. But you and I can testify. So, hey, the blood of Jesus has been shed. Right? The price has been paid. Devil, you have no authority. Am I, uh, am I a sinner? Right now, yes, there may be wrong things that I'm doing. There are things in my life that I have to change. But the blood of Jesus is my testimony. The blood of Jesus will stand for me. I don't have to prove to you anything. Blood of Jesus. So that's your word and your testimony. Everyone got this? Right? They overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Okay. Lucy Samuel asks a question, says, a known pastor passed away who was even practicing wrong things with egg and scissors, exorcism, came to know after taking Bible and ref reference books. Can we take their biblical books from their rack? Okay, so Lucy, see, very important is, now, when you read about other books, the Apostle Paul also writes, he says, and in many places, he says, the Bible teaches us to testify or to test every prophecy, right? So you may have, you, you know, uh, we encourage students to read books, to listen to sermons, but always ask the Holy Spirit, right? Testify of it. Test what you're reading. Now, for example, there's a book, and in the book it says that, uh, you know, only if we, you know, have a uh, fasting and prayer, just an example, right? Only if we fast and pray for, uh, you know, three hours a day, we will enter heaven. Just an example. Now we know it's wrong. So, for example, there's a book that says that Jesus did not die. You know, there's a famous book written, uh, I forget the author, but... Uh, yeah, there's a book where it talks about how Jesus was um, ah, the last temptation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Nicholas, uh, I think he's a Russian who wrote this. He writes that, at the, uh, and they made a movie out of it also, and it's a bestseller book. Right? In this book, he writes and says that, you know, Jesus, uh, on the cross, he was dying, and as he was dying, uh, you know, he just felt, what if I didn't take this up? What would my life be? And so the book goes on to say, say that uh, God the Father granted his request. Okay. And somebody else came on that cross. Jesus got down from the cross, went, got married, lived a life, had children, and died of old age. 
Now, we know that that is not right. We know it is not in line with scripture. So, Lucy, there are books, there are sermons uh, online, right? Uh, there's a lot, right? So it's good to read, good to listen, but always be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Is this preaching, is this teaching in line with the Word of God? Now, there are many books which talk about, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit don't operate now. After the Apostle Paul, you know, Paul writes and he says, uh, the gifts will cease, which means the gifts will stop. So some of them have taken it literally and saying, right now the gifts will stop. There's no gifts, no speaking in tongues, uh, you know, uh, no uh, interpretation of tongues. Certain gifts are not there. Now we know that that's not the truth, right? We know that the Holy Spirit comes, he comes with the gifts and he lets us operate in the gifts. So to answer your question, Lucy, whoever it is, right, whichever book, right, you always test it. Whichever sermon also that you see, you, you always test it. Test it to see whether it is in line with God's word. It is in line with God's, uh, you know, what the Lord Jesus teaches. Right. So if there's a book that says uh, healing is not important, what do we do? Right? We know that it's not right. Now, another important thing to remember, Lucy, is now, there are some wonderful preachers and teachers right, and writers who have written powerful books and powerful uh, preach powerful sermons. But in certain areas, they haven't got revelation, right? meaning they haven't received the full knowledge in certain areas. So they may not, it's just because they didn't, they said some one thing wrong doesn't mean that all that they did is wrong. Right? So we don't judge the person, okay, uh, you know, this person did, did this wrong, so all the other things he did is wrong. No. Right? So we need to be sensitive that way also. So the best thing to do is go back to the Holy Spirit and ask, is this in line with the Word of God? Go back to God's Word. See if this is what God is teaching us. Is this what the Bible says? That's why, you know, when we, when we learn homeunetics, we see that, the Bible is our authority, not a person, not a preacher, not a pastor, not a prophet, nobody. The Bible is the authority. Everything we say and do should be in line with the Bible. Right. Out of the Bible, you know, people will come and prophesy, you're going to be a prophet, you're going to be apostle, all of that. That's good. Right. But test it. Test it with God's word. Okay. Anything that you see now that we have media and technology, there's so much of sermons and videos and all of that. That's there. Listen, it's very good to read and listen, but test it and see if it's in line with God's word. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the next portion. Free in Christ. Chapter 73. We are free from the bondage of law. We already saw that. Galatians 6.15, he says, For Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but a new creation. Now, Paul is writing to the Galatians and he's reminding them, what is circumcision? Circumcision was an act that was given in the old covenant where God said you have to circumcise the male children as a as a saying that they are surrendered to God or they belong to God right so that became a tradition over the years that means if you're circumcised you belong to God now after the Lord Jesus Paul is gone and he's preached the gospel in Galatians in Galatia and people are still getting circumcised so the Apostle Paul is angry he's upset what does he say he's saying in Christ Jesus whether you're circumcised or not circumcised, it doesn't matter. If you're a Jew and you're circumcised, good for you. If you're a Jew and you're not circumcised, but you believe in Jesus, good for you. If you're a Gentile, you're not circumcised and you believe in Jesus, good. There's no difference whether you're circumcised or you're not circumcised. Why is it there no difference? Because that is a work. It is a physical thing. 
It is not, it doesn't have anything to do with the spirit. Everyone, what is 2 Corinthians 5.17? Can you say that? No, without seeing. 2 Corinthians 5.17. We've been doing this for so long. Therefore, hmm, if anyone is in, he is a new creation. Then, all things passed away. All things become new. Right? So you should learn this verse. This is a very important verse. It's a very common verse, right? Because our foundation is that verse. So here he's saying the circumcision is a physical act. God does not look at the physical. Right? Whether we are tall, short, whether we are uh, the way we speak, all of that doesn't matter to God. For God, a new creation is what matters. So here Paul is writing to the believers and saying, don't focus your attention on circumcision. Right? Hey, uh, the other, you know, the Gentiles and the, the Jews especially, what's happening in these churches, the Jews are saying, they are they're not circumcised. Now that they believe in Jesus, they should be circumcised. So Paul is saying, why should they be circumcised? They don't need to be circumcised. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the cross. They believe in everything that Jesus did. Why should they be circumcised? No, but we are circumcised. So then there's a dispute. So the Jews are not only forcing the other Jews, but the Jews are also forcing the Gentiles. Paul says, in Jesus, there is no circumcision, uncircumcision. All of us are equal. What matters is a new creation. So this law of circumcision is removed. It's not there anymore. It doesn't matter. And you know, even now, the Jews get circumcised. Even now. Right? Even in this generation, they do get circumcised. Why? Because they still follow the law. If you go to, if you study about the, uh, the rabbis and the uh, Judaism in right now in Israel, they all get circumcised. And, uh, there are all, you know, it's a big ceremony, like how we have uh, a baby dedication. Right? We have baby dedication, we dedicate the baby. They have circumcision, they circumcise. It's a big celebration. The Jews have a big party. Oh, my baby is circumcised. Why? Because now circumcised, he belongs to God. Whether he becomes a demon or no, in the end, that doesn't matter. Whether he lives the most horrible life, that is secondary. But he belongs to God. That is not how it is. So Jesus is saying it does not matter. What matters is a new creation, a new heart. That's what matters. Right? Then, in, then he goes on to say the perfect law of liberty. Meaning in the New Testament, the standards are higher than that of the, of the Old Testament law. The Old Testament thought, do not commit adultery. But the New Testament says, the Lord Jesus says, if you look lustfully at a man or a woman, you have already committed sin. The Old Testament thought not to murder. But the New Testament thought, if you hate somebody, you have already committed murder. So you look at what Jesus did. He not only said, I've come to keep the law, but he raised the standard. Right? He says, okay. This is where we are right now. I've not come only to fulfill the law, but I've come to raise the standard. In the old covenant, if you it says do not commit adultery. Jesus is saying, if you look at a man or a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery. The new old covenant says, do not murder. Don't go take a knife or a gun and shoot somebody. Don't do that. But in the New Covenant, it says, if you hate somebody, you already committed murder. See the standards? Why, why did Jesus do this? Because he's establishing a more perfect law. The, old, the law of the Old Covenant was not perfect. Nobody could keep those laws. If you look at it, there are hundreds of them, right? In those Ten Commandments, then after that, there are hundreds of laws. And if you break one law, 
you've broken all the law. Right? Imagine 10 commandments. You break one law, you've broken all. You can't go to God and say, God, 8 out of 10. 8 I kept. God will say, no. 2 is gone, it's gone. You have 8 out of 10, it doesn't work. It should be full. Now, by, by nature, it is impossible for us to do that. So what did Jesus say? Next point. Walk in the spirit and you will be able to fulfill every everything that God tells us. L look at uh, Galatians 5.18. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So then you're not thinking, oh, I should not commit adultery. I should not murder. You're not thinking about that because now you're walking in the spirit. The spirit himself will teach us, hey, forget about murder. I should not even hate somebody should walk in love forget about committing adultery i should not even look at a person lustfully and how can that happen through the holy spirit example you know say say so for example somebody has you know you uh, you, you hate somebody right the person hates his brother brother did something wrong he hates him when the name comes on him, he gets angry and but he's a believer. He goes to church every Sunday. He's volunteering every Sunday. He knows all Bible verses, everything he knows. He's a every now and then he's a, you know cell group leader also. But he hates his brother. When the word that brother's name comes, he hates. He did this ten years back. So the Lord Jesus, he has already committed murder. Now what is the solution to it? To walk in the spirit only the holy spirit can enable this person to bring forgiveness 10 years of hurt only the holy spirit can do that you understand so jesus is not just saying okay this is the law he's made the raise the bar higher and he's saying i am giving my spirit to enable you to fulfill all of this right romans 13 8 and 10 Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Love does not harm, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Right? Love is the fulfillment of the law. That means all we have to do is if we love one another, we will fulfill everything that the law says. All the Ten Commandments are fulfilled if we just love one another. Right? So let's go to the next portion. Free from meaningless rituals. Galatians chapter 4, 6 through 11. Again, he's writing to Galatians. Remember the background. Galatians, they are going to circumcision. They're doing some physical work and saying, oh, now God is happy. But they're also praying, doing everything. Right? They're believing in Jesus, but they're also doing this. So now Paul is writing, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods but now after you have known god or rather are known by god how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage you observe days and months and seasons and years i'm afraid for you lest i have labored for you in vain now this is a strong uh, verse here Paul is writing to the Galatians, he's saying, through Christ Jesus, through his spirit, you cry out, Abba, Father. You have been saved. Now, what is the mistake that you are doing is that after you have known God, after you have known the cross, you're going back, not only to the rituals, but you're going back to the idols that you used to worship. And what are you doing? You are opening the door 
for yourself to become a bondage to the devil. So Paul is saying, why do you want to do that? You know, you're observing days, you're observing seasons, you're observing festivals, you're observing uh, all the things that you used to do before when you were Gentiles or when you were worshipping other gods. But now, as a believer, why are you opening the door for the devil to come and put you into bondage? So Paul ends that passage. He says, I'm afraid for you because I'm scared that my, I'm afraid that my labor among you is wasted. This is his first missionary journey in Galatia. Right? He's gone there. He's preached the gospel. The church has been planted. But he's saying, I labored so much, but I'm seeing that you are going back to the old things that you were doing. Then Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, this verse is good. It says, we are the circumcision who worship God. So that means we have already, we don't, we already belong to him. The moment we become believers, it is like we are circumcised unto God. We belong to God. Right? It says that you, you do not belong to a religion. You belong to a person. The person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now, yes, we are there is a religion called Christianity, right? And we are Christians. We believe in Jesus Christ. But we don't belong to Christianity. We don't belong to a religion. It's not about the religion. It's about the person. Right? For example, you have this, uh, you know, forms that you fill in. Religion will come. Now, for example, there's a boy who's born or believe born in a Christian home, but he has no idea about Jesus. He doesn't have any idea. He he does every sin in the world, but religion will come. What will he write? How? He doesn't know about Jesus. He doesn't know anything. All he knows, Jesus died on the but nothing. He'll write Christian. Why? Because he's part of the religion. But you and I are not just part of a religion. We are, we are part of a person. Christianity becomes meaningful when we have a relationship with Jesus. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. We can write Christian. It's not going to, you know, Jesus is not going to be proud. Oh, it's a Christian. No, it is what we do. It's our relationship with him that matters. Right? You, you and I do not live as part of a religious system, but we live in Christ Jesus. So Paul writes and he says, in him we live, we move, and we have our being. Everything that we do, everything that we are, is because of what Jesus did for us. Right? So that should be our, you know, our conviction. That should be our confession every day we are free from man-made ideas there is big portion here in colossians chapter 2 16 to 23 we we'll just finish this and we we'll, uh, so let no one judge you for the food or for you you in food or in drink regarding festival or a new moon or sabbath okay this is a bigger passage okay we'll do this we'll stop we'll pick up from chapter 75 because there's lots that we can discuss here uh, we'll pick up from chapter 75 from the next class, right? Thank you so much. Have a great day ahead. Thank you, students online. God bless. Lucy, I see your questions. Is it okay if we can answer this next class, please? Thank you.